Good morning and welcome back. Today's lecture is going to uh, be a continuation of the lectures on Jacksonian democracy. Uh, and so today we're going to talk about uh, Andrew Jackson's successors and kind of the legacy uh, that he, uh, he had. And so uh, after Jackson leaves office, he is going to be popular amongst the people, right? Uh, he really did a good job of branding himself as a man of the people. Now, you know, uh, he, he vetoed a bunch of bills that, uh, you know, he said that uh, weren't good for the people, uh, which critics would argue is not very democratic and not being very much a man of the people. Because remember, Congress is the most democratic part of our national government. And so their will most directly represents the people's will. But uh, Jackson was able to, you know, convince people that Congress was being run by elites and that the things they, they were doing uh, weren't good for the average person. So he vetoes a lot of stuff. He, uh, you know, uh, is popular because he vetoed the bank and said that the bank was playing favorites and uh, was able to uh, essentially get the bank crushed by pulling uh, federal money out of it. But then, uh, you know, uh, he takes that money and he gives it to banks that are loyal to him, which is, again, playing favorites with the money. And so, uh, you know, Jackson has this weird thing going on where, you know, he truly believes he's the man of the people and he, he you know, bills himself as a man of the people, but kind of all the things that he says he's doing, uh, you know, that are, are helping the people also are kind of not helping the people. And so, you know, is he this like democratic man of the people or is he this tyrant that, uh, you know, pretends to be a man of the people, but really kind of does what he wants? Uh, you know, I don't have the answer to that. I don't really know, uh, but he convinces the people and that's the the important thing. And so uh, when he leaves office, uh, his successor is going to be Martin Van Buren. Uh, we're uh, going to just briefly talk about these uh, successors. We're going to do this relatively quickly. Uh, Martin Van Buren, uh, who was one of uh, Jackson's favorites, uh, you know, he comes to office and uh, the, the the main thing he has to deal with is uh, the expansion out west, right? Uh, Jackson, uh, you know, really pushed the Indian Removal Act uh, and removal policy for Native Americans. Martin Van Buren is going to be the guy that executes that. If you remember from previous lectures, uh, he's the one that actually forced the Cherokee off their land and, and have them go on the Trail of Tears. Now, it was Jackson who orchestrated all that, but it's Martin Van Buren who ex executes it. Uh, so he deals with that. Uh, he also has to deal with wild land speculation. And land speculation uh, essentially just means that people are buying land, speculating or guessing that that land is going to become more valuable. And so now that the natives are off a lot of this land, uh, people are going out and buying up that land. Uh, and many of them aren't small farmers. Uh, they're investors. They're, you know, uh, wealthy people or people with a little bit of money that, you know, get together in large groups and pool their money uh, together. And that's kind of how most of them are. Uh, and they're buying up land uh, and then they're going to take that land and then resell it to smaller farmers later for a profit. And, uh, you know, they really come up with an ingenious way to do that. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, we have different states have different currency. We haven't quite figured out how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, have a single coherent monetary system. And so because each of these different states have different currencies, some of them are more valuable than others. And so, you know, some states don't print a lot of money and other states do. The states that don't print a lot of money or they have money that's backed by an asset like gold, uh, there, since there's not a lot of it, it's worth more. Right. And it's other states, uh, you know, they print a ton of money and there's so much of it out there that it's not really worth as much. Right. And so that's, you know, those are kind of inflationary principles. Uh, you know, the more of something that there is, the less valuable it is. We all kind of understand that. So let's just say that. And I'm just making this up. The, 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 like the, the concept is true, but the example I'm just making up as an example. Let's say, you know, uh, Boston is just printing a ton of money. 
Uh, but Virginia's not. So Virginia's money is very, very valuable. Whereas uh, Massachusetts and, and the money that's coming out of Boston, Massachusetts' money, uh, they, there's so much of it, it's not worth a, a whole lot. Well, when land goes out for sale and say, you know, the Ohio territory, whose money are you going to use uh, to buy that land? Well, you're not going to use Virginia's because it, it's really expensive. If the land costs $100 and I use Virginia's money, right? Well, that $100 could maybe buy me a thousand cattle, right? But with the money from Massachusetts, right, that $100 could probably only buy me 10 cattle. So it's not as valuable. It can't buy as much stuff. So when the land goes for sale and they say they want $100 for it, if you've got $100 of Virginia money, you know what you do? You take that $100 of Virginia money, you trade it for money from Massachusetts. And so that $100 of Virginia money might get you, uh, you know, $1,000 of uh, Massachusetts money. And then instead of going and buying $100 worth of land in the Ohio Territory, you buy $1,000 worth of land for your $100 you know, Virginia dollars, your original hundred Virginia dollars. And so they're using the, the different values of currency to uh, buy land extremely cheaply and uh, to, to buy more land than they probably should. And that becomes a real problem. And so uh, what ends up happening is, you know, Andrew Jackson, you know, uh, orders a, the species circular, but Martin Van Buren, again, like is the guy that has to execute this and deal with it. It's really Jackson's fault, uh, but it just kind of one of those things that happens under Martin Van Buren's administration. Uh, and the species circular says this, it's like, whoa, people are manipulating this. The federal government's not getting the amount of money uh, that it deserves for this land. And remember, we don't have an income tax yet. So the sale of land is, is vitally important to the federal government to be able to, to afford to do things. And so they feel like they're getting ripped off. So the species circular tries to fix that. And it says that to get land, you have to pay for land with either gold or silver, right? Gold or silver is gold and silver are both stable currency. It's gold is worth the same in Virginia as it is in Massachusetts, as it is in Georgia, as it is in Pennsylvania. Right. And so uh, this will ease that uh, that monetary tension that that's happening. And, and it makes sure that people aren't ripping off the federal government. Uh, it is also deflationary. Right. And so uh, it, it's going to kind of stabilize the money market, but it's going to put a huge crunch on the credit market. Because uh, people that were buying land, all of a sudden now, people aren't able to get their hands on land as, as much as, as they uh, were before. And so uh, it's going to cause uh, a panic. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it really, uh, Martin Van Buren here, and this is Martin Van Buren, um, gotta love those uh, uh, sideburns there. Uh, the species circular is really gonna be uh, blamed for causing the, the panic of 1837. And Martin Van Buren is gonna take the blame for that. It's really, like I said, not his fault. This policy is a Jackson policy and it's not the wrong policy. Uh, you know, it, it's clear we can't have people ripping off uh, the federal government like that. And, you know, the it, it's not the average small farmer that is is doing this thing it's the the manipulating the money supply it is kind of these uh you know elites easterners uh that land speculators that are doing this uh, and so we have to stabilize the system the problem is sometimes doing the right thing stabilize which is good for the long term sometimes is bad for the short term and so it does cause a panic in 1837 and cause some pain that that martin van buren has to get the credit take the credit for or take the blame for, I should say. Uh, also, the fact that you have to use silver and gold, uh, that also hurts small farmers because it's, if you're a small farmer, you probably don't have silver and gold. And so, you know, but, you know, rich Eastern elites uh, do have silver and gold. So, you know, it does make it harder for small farmers to get land. Uh, they can still get it, right? I mean, you can figure out ways to get silver and gold. You know, they can, you know, uh, buy it and, and, and you know, 
trade for it and, and whatnot. So you can, small farmers can still get it. It just makes, it's an added step. It's just one more thing to make it a little bit more difficult for small farmers uh, to get it. So, uh, you know, necessary step for sure. Right. Uh, I mean, we have to have some consistency. We, we've got to figure that out. Uh, but the problem is the fix to that, which is beneficial in the long term, right, hurts in the short term. Uh, and that that's with economic policy. That happens a lot. We'll we'll talk about some of that during the, the Great Depression and, uh, you know, in, in those lectures and how sometimes doing the right thing is painful right and so uh that kind of really ruins martin van buren's uh administration the next president is william henry harrison uh, william henry harrison is uh actually kind of a uh rejection of uh, you know, of the Democratic Party, people are upset with Martin Van Buren, and so they'll move towards the Whig Party. Uh, William Henry Harrison is a Whig. Uh, the Whigs believe that the federal government has gone too powerful, and so uh, it's the uh, you know the idea behind the Whigs is to dial back the federal government, give more power to the state governments, um, which is weird because that's Jefferson and Jackson says that he's like. Jefferson, but he wildly expanded the powers of, of the federal government. And so William Henry Harrison uh, says, you know, we have to shrink the federal government. Um, he, he really doesn't have, uh, you know, there's really not a lot to say here because, you know, he gets elected, you know, based on uh, his uh, experiences uh, during the uh, Indian Wars. And so, you know, the famous phrase is uh, Tippecanoe and, and Tyler II. Uh, Tippecanoe, William Henry Harrison, the Battle of Tippecanoe uh, was where he gets famous. Uh, he's old and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, while, while campaigning are, you know, going to bring up how old he is. And so he wants to uh, present uh, this and you know he's he's really you know because Jackson made politics about the common man uh, they really kind of play up William Henry Harrison as this like common man the problem is he really isn't intellectual he is really smart uh, and so when he gets elected and he gives his inaugural speech uh, he wants to do two things with that speech he wants to uh, prove he's not old so he you know it's like a cold rainy day he wants to show that he's vital and and not old so he goes out without you know a heavy coat and uh it stands out there you know essentially getting soaked in in the cold to show how like young and tough he is and then he wants to prove that he does know what he's talking about that he is an intellectual and he gives this really long speech um well while he's out there he's gonna get pneumonia and that'll kill him so uh you know he he's gonna die uh because of that speech which means boom this guy right here, William Henry Harrison, dies, and John Tyler is going to take over. Uh, what's really interesting with Tyler is, uh, you know, well, one, he's going to be the the first president to take over because uh, the former pre first vice president to take over because a president died in office. Uh, so, you know, that situation has never. It's not really at this point in history, it's not really spelled out in the constitution how that happens. Nobody's convinced that just because you're vice president, you get to be uh, actually the president. Some people think that you're just a stand in until there's an, a special election. Some people think that the vice president just stands in until the house of representatives picks another president. Uh, nobody really knows. And John Tyler really settles that. And he settles it just by saying I'm president. And then he acts like he's president. And then everybody else is like, all right, uh, and kind of goes along with it. And so we, uh, you know, thank you, John Tyler, for providing uh, stability in that situation because, you know, it, it really could have been a contentious, problematic thing, except he just was like, no, nope, I got this. Uh, and so, uh, shockingly, uh, you know, he gets elected as a Whig, but they'll eventually kick him out of the Whig party because uh, deep down, he's really a Democrat. Uh, he, he believes in kind of this uh, expansive power of, of the government. And he's probably one of the most underrated presidents uh, that we uh, that we ever have. Uh, he d does all kinds of amazing things. Um, he's the guy that annexes Texas. 
So, you know, I mean, he's an expansionist president. Uh, we'll talk about Texas later. Texas was a part of Mexico. Uh, you know, Stephen Austin and Sam Houston uh, are Americans that are transplanted living in Texas. They overthrow the Mexican government in Santa Ana uh, and they become their own country. They want to be a state, but America's like, at first they're like, no, we don't want to mess with Mexico. Uh, but then eventually uh, it's going to be Tyler who figures out, no, nah, we're just going to annex them, which essentially means we're going to make them ours without giving them full s statehood yet, yeah, full, full, uh, rights and citizenship and, and all of that, which, but being annexed is like the first step in that process. Uh, so he does that. Uh, he's going to settle the Canadian border, uh, with, uh, the United States. We're not, you know, the, in like the Oregon territory and out in, uh, that area. And we'll talk about this in future lectures. We're going to do a uh, westward expansion, uh, lecture that's going to cover the details of this, uh, but he settles that border. Remember Florida from a previous lecture, Jackson fought the Seminole, essentially kicked out the Spanish, and then it just, Florida, what is Florida? Uh, well, it's going to be Tyler that makes it a state. So think about this. John Tyler, a guy that most of you have never, ever heard of before, uh, is the guy that gives us Texas. He gives us Florida and he settles the border with the northern border with Canada. I mean, that's like uh, crazy, right? And so uh, he's also going to uh, veto the National Bank. This is going to be a thing that's going to get him in trouble with the Whigs. This is an extension of Jackson's uh, policy on the bank, right? That's a democratic idea. And so all of this is, uh, you know, just, I mean, Tyler just does a ton of stuff. I mean, this guy, he's industrious. He works hard. He's, you know, I mean, he's like one of the first presidents that really kind of streamlines the bureaucracy. He works, you know, today we know that all of our presidents, even though all the time on the news, it's like, you know, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, they, they went and played golf today or they're on vacation at Martha's Vineyard. The reality is that's crazy. Don't listen to that. Uh, those guys work 12 hours a day every day and 18 hours a day every once in a while. I mean, like that, that it is even when they're playing golf, they're working, even when they're on vacation. Doesn't matter the political party, Republican, Democrat. That's just the media selling a shocking story. Uh, they work all the time. Uh, that wasn't always the case. John Tyler is, is one of the first presidents really to just dig in and, you know, like dig into policy, become an expert on monetary policy, become an expert on these issues. Uh, and so uh, he really kind of sets that tone. It's not that previous presidents didn't do that, but they just didn't always do that. It's, you know, Tyler's, uh, you know, is really good at that. Um, so, you know, probably the the best president that you've never heard of uh, gets kicked out of the, the Whig Party eventually. And see, here's one of the things that kind of uh, is going to lessen his legacy. Uh, eventually, you know, once he, he uh, finishes out his time in office, uh, he's going to go back to Virginia and continue in politics in Virginia. Uh, when the Civil War happens, uh, Tyler's in the Virginia uh, legislature, and he will vote to secede from the Union and will join the Confederacy. And so, uh, you know, does a lot of great stuff for America. And then when uh, we get down to the Civil War, he's going to uh, kind of, you know, he doesn't undo all the good things he did for sure. Uh, but if his side would have won, it would have undone all the good things that he did, uh, or at least there would have been more bad than good. So, uh, you know, complicated man, just like all these other people, you know, we tend to idolize our historical figures, uh, you know, founding fathers or, you know, uh, war generals or civil rights leaders, or and then we, we are shocked to find out uh, that they're flawed. Uh, well, they're human and we're all human and we're all flawed and you know, a standard of perfection is ridiculous. Uh, you know, that's the why it, uh, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the legacy, uh, this is Tyler right here. Uh, the legacy of Andrew Jackson is, you know, uh, it's going to change politics forever because it's really going to play up 
uh, you know, populism and the idea that, uh, you know, you, you got to appeal to the masses and not just the elites. Uh, now, whether or not Jackson really was this, you know, uh, guy that expanded democracy, uh, I don't I don't know that that's the case. I don't know that it's not the case. Right. Uh, he definitely appealed to the masses, uh, did everything he do benefit the masses? Certainly not. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, did he, you know, did he expand democracy? Did he not? I don't know. You know, that's up to you uh, to decide. The, uh, but, you know, the idea of appealing to the masses is, you know, it is an important thing. And, and he really uh, will, will, spread that. He also is going to greatly expand the powers of the presidency. Uh, you know, I mean, he's going to just assume that he has the authority to do things even when he doesn't. Uh, I mean, he like clearly uh, when, you know, the Supreme Court tells him that the Cherokee get to stay in Georgia and he kicks him out anyway, that definitely makes the, the presidency more, uh, more powerful. And later presidents will use that as president to expand their own power. So uh, definitely, a uh you know definitely a very influential president all right uh that's all we have for today thank you very much for your time have a good day and i will see you again shortly